Welcome back Highlanders. Uh, this is the lecture for Friday, March 13th, 2020. We're going to be talking about chapter 10, which is price search and markets with low barriers to entry. Although this uh, lecture will hopefully be a little bit more fun and entertaining because I'm not going to talk about the graph part. I'm just going to focus on the philosophy behind competition and entrepreneurship. Something that's pretty important if you're going to start your own business one day or if you're one of those pre-business administration majors in the class. So here's the quick overview for the chapter. We're going to review the role of profits and losses in a competitive environment. And then we'll talk about entrepreneurship and creative destruction. Right, two terms that kind of go hand in hand when we talk about how we uh, create products over time. So with that in mind, let's kind of talk a little bit about the economics of business failure. That's where we left off at the end of Chapter 9, uh, last class. So remember, we were talking about long-run equilibrium in that perfectly competitive market. If a firm is making positive economic profits, firms are going to jump in and compete away those economic profits. They're going to enter the market, drive those profits down until all firms are making zero economic profit in the long run. Equally important, if a firm is making economic losses, those firms making losses are making less money in that industry than they could if they use their resources for other things. So they're going to leave the market, and as they leave the market, the remaining firms are going to see the price and demand for their products increase until they're making zero economic profits in the long run. So competition will drive failing firms out of business and free up those resources used by that firm for more productive use. In order to help illustrate that, let's go through a quick mathematical example. So again, I'm going to exit the uh, full slide mode here so I can use my different colors. But remember that when we're calculating profit, profit is equal to total revenue minus total cost. All right, so I want you to imagine a business that's starting up. Maybe it's a business producing those pro-economic slogan t-shirts that you all wrote those ideas for. If that business is starting up, let's imagine how, uh, what the costs and revenues of those business will be. So let's say for the sake of argument that this business is producing uh, 10 shirts. And in terms of the money they spend in uh, shirt material, ink, labor, all that adds up to $8 per shirt. So 10 shirts at $8 per shirt comes out to a total cost of $80. Now let's say they go to uh, sell those shirts and customers are really digging them. They want to wear those pro-economic slogan t-shirts. It turns out there's even more economic uh, nerds out there like me than we might have thought. In which case, let's say they can sell all these shirts at a price of $10 a piece. So that's 10 shirts at $10 each. So yeah, if we calculate that out, that is $100 in revenues. Right, so we have $100 in revenues, $80 in costs. That's going to give us a profit equal to $20. That P is looking pretty ugly. Let's see if we can do that a little bit better. There you go. All right, so what does that mean philosophically? That means that this company took $80 worth of stuff and it turned it into $100 worth of stuff. Or to think of this way, it took $8 worth of stuff and it turned it into $10 worth of stuff 10 times. Right? What that means is that this company is taking the world's scarce resources and it's creating value from them. Right? Again, it took $80 worth of the world's scarce resources and it turned it into $100 worth. Right? That's something that's good for the world. Right? They're increasing the value of the world's resources. That's a business that's probably going to stick around right? and continue to do that for some time. Now let's say look at a different example, right? Let's say that a firm has the same cost. Again, they're making 10 shirts at a cost of $8 per shirt. So that is a total of $80 that they spend making these shirts. And then they go to sell them. As it turns out, there's not nearly as many economic nerds like me out there as we thought there was going to be, right? So people aren't willing to pay $10 for those shirts. In fact, they couldn't sell any shirts until they lowered the price down to maybe $5. So when we get the revenues, they're able to sell all 10 shirts maybe at a price of $5 per shirt. So that's going to give them $50 in revenues, but they spent $80 to get that $50. Hopefully you know by now, by now that that means that they have a loss of $30. So again, what does that mean philosophically? It means they took $80 worth of stuff and they turned it into $50 worth of stuff, or they destroyed the value of the world's scarce resources. That's like a small crime, right? Again, they made the world worse off by participating in this particular industry. 
So again, while a business going out of business is tough on the owners and those employees, right? It might not necessarily be a bad thing for the world if that company goes out of business, because then it's going to free up those scarce resources that they're destroying in value, right? It's going to free those up for the more profitable companies, the ones who can better create value from those resources, right? So again, it's probably a good thing that companies who are making losses eventually go out of business and free up those resources for those more profitable firms. Right? So with that in mind, I've got a quick video clip that I wanted to show you all and that we would have watched if we were in class. So this video clip is from the show It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Right, this is uh, Charlie Kelly's advertisement for a new product he's created called Kitten Mittens. I want you to think if this product would be successful in the real world and whether or not Charlie Kelly's firm should stay in business or would eventually go out of business. Right, let's take a look. Charlie Kelly, local business owner and cat enthusiast. Is your cat making too much noise all the time? Is your cat constantly stomping around, driving you crazy? Is your cat clawing at your furniture? Think there's no answer? You're so stupid. There is. Kitten mittens. Finally, there's an elegant, comfortable mitten for cats. So again, in watching that commercial, do you think kitten mittens would stay in business or do you think it would go out of business? My guess is that in the real world, kitten mittens wouldn't last very long, probably go out of business. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because it would free up those scarce resources like the yarn and the labor used to produce those kitten mittens. It'd free those up for, again, more profitable uses or for uses by companies that could figure out a better way to satisfy the public with those uh, materials or those resources. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and segue a little into entrepreneurship. So an entrepreneur is a person who introduces new products or improved technolo technologies. And the thing I want you to know about entrepreneurship is that this is something where the possibilities of what you could invent or what you could produce, they're fairly endless. Right? Everyone always likes to say that, you know, the greatest inventions have already been invented or how am I supposed to come up with something new when all these uh, things are already out there. Right. But again, the possibilities of new stuff is endless. And when I talk about um, entrepreneurship, I'm not just talking about new products. It could be new ways of producing products that already exist that are maybe faster, cheaper, or less costly. To give you a sense of how endless the potential ideas are, uh, are that are out there, I'm going to go through a quick mathematical example. So imagine you took a regular deck of playing cards and you just selected three cards from that regular deck. Let's say that you have that nine, two, and five. So I'm going to ask you, how many ways are there to arrange those cards to come up with a new uh, way of viewing those cards that haven't been seen before yet? So right now we're looking at these cards, right, with the 9, 2, and 5. That's one way to go, right? But we can also organize these cards in a different way, right? In other words, we can have the 9, and then we can put the 5 and the 2. And again, that's a new way of looking at those cards or a new possibility that's created from those three cards, right? We could also have the five, two, and nine, right? Or we could organize it in such a way that we have the five, nine, and two, right? Or we could put the two first. So we have the two, five, nine. Or finally, we have the two, nine, five. I think that's it. So those are the six ways to arrange the set of uh, three cards to come up with some new combination that we haven't seen yet. Right? So rather than go through those iterations, right, there's actually a simple way to do this. Right? So if you ever looked at your calculator, you wondered, like, what is that exclamation point for? That's called factorial. And what three factorial is, is it's basically three times all the whole numbers before it. So three factorial is equal to three times two times one, that's a total of six, right? Again, that's the six combinations that we can produce with these cards. Oops. I don't know what happened there. Let's get that box back, All right? Now, what if we just add one more card to that list, right? Well, if we have four cards, we're trying to figure out what are the different ways that we can arrange four cards, 
Well, 4 factorial is 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. And that's going to be a total of 24. If we were to add just one more card to that list, right, 5 factorial is again equal to 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. And that is equal to 120. All right, so as you can see, this number increases pretty exponentially or pretty rapidly. All right. So with that in mind, I want you to imagine that each one of these cards is a resource. And remember, a resource is anything we use to produce something else. Right? We talk about the human resources, like your uh, knowledge or creativity, speed, strength, or ingenuity. Right? We talk about those physical resources, like hammers and nails and two-by-fours, chainsaws. Right? We talk about those natural resources, like coal or iron ore or gold. Right, so again, imagine you had three resources, like a hammer, a nails, and someone's time or labor. That's three resources, right? If we were to add, say, uh, cement to that, then you'd have four resources. If we were to add, say, gold to that, you'd have five resources. So again, it's pretty easy to see that there are thousands of resources out there, right? But what if there wasn't thousands? Wasn't, what if there was just 52? In other words, what does 52 factorial look like? How many ways are there to arrange all 52 cards in a 52-card deck? Right. And I want you to go ahead and take a second and see if you can guess the number, right? Is it in the billions? Is it in the trillions? Is it just in the thousands? What do you think 52 factorial might look like? So go ahead and take a second. Get ready to have your minds blown. And boom, that's what 52 factorial looks like. That's a 68-digit number, right? To give you an idea of how big this number is, right? This right here is millions. This right here is billions. This is trillions. This is quadrillions. Uh, I'm not really sure what they're called after that. Do we call these quintillions? I don't know. I haven't really seen numbers that big in the real world. right? But the idea is that this is a huge number. right? And this is just the number of ways there are to arrange 52 cards, the standard number of cards in one deck. Again, we have thousands of resources out there. So you can imagine, again, the endless possibilities there are when it comes to arranging these resources to produce something new. Right? So here is a quote from a statistician. He says, imagine you could shuffle the deck of cards a thousand times per second, and everyone on earth, all seven billion plus people, has their own deck of cards, and they're all shuffling them to a thousand times each second. Now imagine everyone continues to do this for the next 10 billion years, and all those shuffles, you wouldn't have rearranged the cards the total number of possible ways. What that means is that it is very statistically likely that every time you shuffle a deck of cards, you come up with a new combination that has never been seen before, and that will never, ever be seen again. Right. So what does this got to do with entrepreneurship? Well, I want you to think of some of the great entrepreneurs throughout history. right? So again, successful entrepreneurs are those who increase the value of our resources or make those profits versus those who might destroy the value of our resources or make those losses. So Henry Ford didn't invent the concept of the automobile, but what he did do is he invented a new way to make automobiles with a moving assembly line. Right, so you put some parts on one end of an assembly line, right? somebody uh, turns a screw or fastens a door on, and then that uh, uh, set of parts goes to the next person on the assembly line. Right, They turn a screw or fasten on another door, goes to the next person, and by the time it gets to the end of the assembly line, right, then it has a completed car. And we found out that we can make cars so much quicker and so much faster that way that we'd also make them a lot cheaper, and a lot of people who couldn't afford cars before can now afford them. Right. Henry Ford was also known for paying people above average wages in order to attract good employees and to keep them working for them. Right. That's a concept called the efficiency wage, which you might learn if you take intermediate economics. Right. Jeff Bezos is the uh, founder and CEO of Amazon. Again, he didn't really invent those products, just kind of a new way of marketing and selling them. He's now become uh, the richest person in the world through his efforts. Again, this is an entrepreneur who didn't invent a new product, but just a new way of producing or selling products in such a way to get uh, those products to people a lot faster. And in doing so, again, was quite successful for himself, but also made the world a much better place in terms of uh, people taking advantage of buying things online. I want you to ask you a question here, right? This group of individuals, if this group of individuals here came knocking on your door asking you to invest in their company, would you do it? Would you give them your money to start a company with? If you did, you'd be a multi-billionaire right now because these are the founders of Microsoft, right? So you'd be a founding shareholder of Microsoft if you actually did invest in their money and be richer than I can imagine. This individual right here is a very young Bill Gates, fresh out of dropping out of college to start that software company. 
Bill Gates is another entrepreneur, somebody who invented a, a new software that people really enjoy. Right? Again, people are better off for buying a software. He's created value out of the world's resources when he produced it. Again, as long as these transactions are happening as a result of voluntary exchange, then people are being made better off on both sides of that exchange as a result. Right. So this is one of my favorite parts of class. Right? One thing about entrepreneurship is that it's kind of hard to know in advance what will work. So here is a quote from Ken Olson. He is the chairman founder of a digital equipment corporation in 1977. In other words, this is kind of one of the most advanced members of a technological company in the 70s. This is kind of like the Bill Gates or Steve Jobs of his time. He said at the one time that there is no reason why anyone would want a computer in their home. And again, as it turns out, he couldn't have been more wrong. But why was he saying that? Right. Well, look at what computers looked like back in the 1970s. They had these huge machines that took up half the room. And all I do is kind of crunch numbers similar to what your graphing calculator can do today. Would you want one of those in your own home? I know I wouldn't. Right? He didn't imagine that the computers today would be able to do things like uh, download music, watch movies, uh, Facebook with your friends. He didn't see all that stuff coming. He didn't know the internet was going to be a thing. So again, it was easy to make that statement in the 1970s. Of course, he turned out to be incorrect. Another one of my favorites is that Fred Smith is the uh, founder and CEO of FedEx. Right? For his Yale University senior project, he turns in the business idea for FedEx. And his Yale University business professor gives him a C. And he wrote on the paper that the concept is interesting and well-formed, but in order to earn better than a C, the idea must be feasible. Now, he, of course, uh, tells everybody about this uh, grade that he got on his uh, business project uh, uh, at Yale. And they ask his professor, what were you thinking? You're supposed to be a business professor at one of the best schools in the country. How could you have been so wrong? He said, look, at the time, the only people who were delivering packages and mail was the U.S. Post Office, right? They already get subsidized by uh, taxpayer dollars, right? So how are you going to outcompete the government and something like that? I didn't think it was possible. But Fred Smith found a way to deliver packages and letters so quickly and efficiently that he actually was able to outcompete the government even with the taxpayer dollars that the government was getting or that the post office was getting from the government. And then finally, who would have thought that the Snuggie would turn out to be a multi-million dollar idea? After all, it's kind of just a blanket with sleeves sleeves or a robe that you put on backwards. Talking about combining two resources that you didn't think about combining before. Combining, again, uh, sleeves with a blanket and you create a new product that turned out to be a huge hit. Uh, I didn't think it was going to be nearly as popular when it came out, but as it turns out, it is. All right, um, one person actually gave me a Snuggie for uh, my birthday as a joke gift. And I said, joke's on you. I actually enjoy it. I ended up getting my brother a Street Fighter 2 themed Snuggie. Yes, that exists for his birthday. I think he uh, uses it a lot more than he cares to admit. Right. So the point here is that you don't know what products are going to work in advance. So it's important to be able to go out there and try new ideas. Right. All right. So let's get into that term creative destruction. Right. Creative destruction is a replacement of old products and production methods by innovative new ones that consumers judge to be superior. So my favorite example to go over creative destruction is the idea of how the music industry has changed over the years. If you talk to your parents or maybe now even your grandparents about how they used to listen to music, they used to listen on those big Wi-Fi records. Right? And then somewhere along the line, we came up with this uh, eight-track tape, and the eight-track tape was able to replace those big vinyl records. It was able to play music a little bit more clearly. Right? It was more portable. You could uh, put an eight-track tape deck in your car. But then the cassette tape came out and uh, replaced the eight-track tape. And when the cassette tape came out, if you were an 8-track tape producer, right, you were in a little bit of trouble. You either had to adapt and start selling cassette tapes, or you risk going out of business. Again, cassette, tape, cassette tapes were a little bit smaller, a little bit more portable, and more efficient than the 8-track tape. And then C CDs came out and started to replace cassette tapes. Again, if you were a cassette tape broker, you had to make the transition over to CDs, or you might end up going out of business. And then finally, we have digital music now replacing CDs. Very few people own CDs anymore. When I bought my last car, I didn't even have a CD player in it because now everybody's listening to their music digitally. All right. So again, this is the idea of creative destruction is every new thing comes out and kind of replaces or destroys the old thing. So the creation of the 8-track destroyed the records. The creation of the cassette tape destroyed the 8-track. The creation of CDs destroyed the cassette tape. And finally, the creation of digital music destroyed those CDs. This was a term that was coined by... A uh, Austrian economist who used to uh, study and do his work at Harvard by the name of Joseph Schumpeter, uh, kind of an interesting guy. He said he had three main goals in his life. He was wanted to be the best economist in the world, the best horseman in Austria, he liked raising horses, and the best lover in Vienna. Uh, he said that uh, he accomplished two of the, uh, three of those goals, but he never said which ones. He's been dead for a long time now, so I guess we'll never know.
So the important thing about this process of creative destruction is it helps generate economic growth and higher standards of living uh, for a lot of people, right? Especially if it's happening through this voluntary exchange. All right, so I want you to think of life today compared to life maybe 150 or even 20 years ago, right? So a lot of people I know are kind of struggling right now because of that coronavirus, but even our average lives today are a lot better than life was, say, 50 or 100 years ago. With that in mind, I want you to take a look at how our medicine has changed over the years, right? So this right here is a very real medical kit that was used uh, right around the time of the Civil War, right? If you're looking at this medical kit, you're going to notice a few things. One is that you're going to see a saw here. Right, what do you think that saw was used for? If you guess it was used to amputate your limbs when they became infected, you are correct. Right, you just saw people's limbs off. Uh, and by the way, there was no really uh, good anesthesia, they just kind of got you drunk or liquored up, and they gave you this strap here to bite on. Right, so you can bite on that and take the pain while they're sawing your leg off. Right, that's a horror movie now. That was standard medical care uh, about 100 years ago. Right, now look at the kinds of medical care that we have today. We have all these kinds of MRI imaging machines. I told you all that I was diagnosed with cancer when I was 23 years old. It's about 13 years ago now. And I was diagnosed using one of these machines. If these machines didn't exist uh, 13 years ago, then I might not be alive. You'd have somebody else's recording to listen to right now. Right. Look at how entertainment has changed over the years. Right. This is the game that my instructor or economics professor used to play uh, when he played football. Uh, when he played a football video game. Basically, you take that white dot and you try to navigate it through those uh, red dots there. Now, this is the game that me and my friends used to play growing up. It's called Super Tecmo Bowl. Right? We played it for the uh, regular 8-bit Nintendo. And me and my friends were playing this game. We're like, this is the pinnacle of video games. How's it ever going to get better than Super Tecmo Bowl? Right? You actually see the names and numbers of the players. You actually have real statistics. You have time. You have a score. You've got players that look like players. You've got a ball that looks like a ball. Right? There's no way that there's ever going to be a football game better than this. We had no idea the kinds of football games that are going to be invented later where not only do they have uh, players, and you can see individual players, but now you can actually see individual muscle strands within the players, right? You've got announcers asking you questions like why you're going forward on 4th and 40, right? It's kind of a, a whole new genre of video games now, one that we certainly didn't expect. And again, whenever these new video games come out, they start to replace the old ones and kind of push our living standards forward. So the whole idea here of this entrepreneurship is that, again, as long as you're making your money through voluntary exchange, you're making people better off and you're pushing the world forward you're certainly not really holding it back. Right? So with that in mind, I've got one more video clip I'd like to watch here for the quarter. Right? This one is more of a motivational clip. It's about how entrepreneurship and poverty uh, kind of relate or go hand in hand, and that those who kind of grew up in impoverished conditions often are the best at engaging in entrepreneurship. Let's watch this video and talk a little bit about why. This is our last video and our last John Mustache Stossel clip of the quarter. Let's let the stash take us home. This school was once considered New York City's worst, lowest reading scores in the state. Kids assaulted teachers more than once a week. One teacher's hair was set on fire. It was around then that Steve Mariotti left his import-export business to teach here. What's 40 plus 20? At first, he says, he was a horrible teacher. I lost control of my classes. A kid got me in a headlock, rubbing my head. In desperation, he asked the kids, why are you doing this to me? One kid said, we did it because we can't, just can't stand you. You are boring. And I said, well, was there ever a time when I was a good teacher, when I touched you or taught you something that had any value? And the same young man said, that the only time you really had value to, uh, to me was when you told us about your import-export business and how you bring in lady shoes at $5 from Anchor, India, add a dollar on for insurance and freight, take down the Lower East Side and sell them for $7, and your income statement would be $126,000. Oh, he'd remembered all this from the beginning of the term? He remembered. And here was a guy that had been defined as, as brain damaged, emotionally upset. Every, people were afraid of him. And he recreated, in total, a Harvard Business School income statement. Does anybody have any ideas for a small business that you could start right now as a kid? Mariotti changed his way of teaching. And you can trade with anybody in the room. Now, he started talking about making money. And suddenly the kids were different. When you hear people complaining, that's where the big money is. They're suddenly interested in learning. And they come to life in the classroom. His teaching changed lives. You found my gotcha jersey? In high school, Frank Alameda was floundering until he took Mariotti's course. He graduated and went on to open a sporting goods manufacturing company. 
Now he employs people from his old neighborhood. I'm probably the biggest thing that happened to my family because I, I got people looking up to me, people that I grew up with, just oh, will pat me on my back, will say, Frank, keep it up. You're the only guy that got something going for you out here. Will there be better days? Jimmy McNeil started a music business that was worth a million dollars. And we got to Southern New Fort. Now he runs Bulldog like Bicycles, a high-performance bike company. How's the back end on that? It's good? Here he is on the cover of Black Enterprise magazine. It still gets down to machining costs. He says he owes all this to what Steve Mariotti taught him in high school. Okay. Children that are born into poverty have very unique abilities in business and entrepreneurship. They've got chutzpah, they're street smart, they're comfortable with risk and ambiguity. They have many of the natural characteristics of the great business people. We think of capitalism as something the privileged practice, but in some ways, capitalism is the big equalizer. Money doesn't care if you're black or white or green. It's the people at the bottom who need capitalism most, who need the, the, the system in which everyone is free to trade and free to pursue money, because capitalism opens up opportunities to climb up that economic ladder. Somewhere along the lines, Bill Gates started off with zero. Somewhere along the lines, Quincy Jones started off with zero. My rule for kids... It's not a color thing. You know, it's an opportunity thing. So again, when you think of entrepreneurship, it's something that anybody who has the, uh, the ambition can try and really profit from. Right? It's uh, something that you could even start doing right now as a young college student. You uh, created a business where you make and sell study guides. That's a form of entrepreneurship and one way to earn an income. All right, so that is it for this chapter. Understand the concept of creative destruction. Make sure, you under, make sure you're able to recognize that term on the exam, and then how entrepreneurship leads to economic growth. This idea of creating these new products that customers value is what uh, puts us uh, uh, forward or moves us forward as an economy. And that is it for the class, right? So we've climbed to the top of that microeconomic, microeconomic mountain. We started from the bottom, now we're here. Right, so congratulations on making the summit or completing the ascent. I just want to thank you all for your uh, attention this quarter. I'm sorry that the quarter wrapped up the way it did where we had to finish it online, uh, but hopefully you still got a lot out of the class and you enjoyed it and uh, learned something. With that in mind, if you ever need anything in the future, just let me know. Uh, good luck studying for the finals. As of right now, the review sessions are going forward as planned, and I'll be making videos on those review sessions in the next couple days. So if you can't make it or choose not to, you're still able to benefit from them.